Well, good afternoon, and welcome to our event, Connecting America, Getting Taxpayers Their Money's Worth in Broadband Expansion. I'm Mark Jamison, a non-resident senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. On November 15, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. It included $42.5 billion for broadband development under what is called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, or BEAD. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, oversees this program, but it's the states that are doing all the heavy lifting. This $42.5 billion is in addition to other federal money and state money that is subsidizing broadband development. But there's much, and there's much to be done, according to NTIA, about 8% of Americans lack access to broadband, and that percentage jumps to 40% if you just consider rural America. But there are problems. There are around 150 state and federal broadband programs out there, with some being around for an embarrassing number of years, which according to our academic studies that we're able to find and study and look at, they've had little effect on broadband adoption. So will we get it right this time? Ensuring that is the purpose of AEI's Broadband Barometer Project, helping the states to succeed where others have failed. Our team of scholars have examined all state efforts so far and have identified at least three states, Louisiana, Idaho, and Mississippi, as being amongst the best of what they've accomplished to date anyway. We're still in the planning stages. So here to discuss lessons from these states are three state leaders and a noted scholar who has done the heavy lifting in reviewing the state efforts. With us are Sally Doty. She's the Director of Broadband Expansion and Accessibility in Mississippi. She's been a state senator, run a property rental company, and a practicing attorney. And she's connected with a friend of mine, Marty Linsky of Harvard University. Uh, more on him later. We also have Ramon Habde Sanchez, the broadband manager with Idaho Commerce. He has served in the Idaho Transportation Department, the Office of Attorney General, and the Legislative Services Office. We also have Vanith Eingar, Executive Director of Connect LA in Louisiana. He's previously with the staff of the East Baton Rouge Parish Mayor President's Office. He co-chaired the Governor's Resilient Louisiana Healthcare Task Force, and he was formerly with Sage Growth Partners. And then last but certainly not least is Dr. Janice Hauge, Professor of Economics at the University of North Texas, She's a board member with the Telecommunications Policy Research Group on our team of scholars that, that uh, overseeing this particular project with AEI and has published widely in scholarly journals on broadband, antitrust, and other topics. So Sally, Ramon, Vanith, and Janice, welcome. I have a few questions for each of you and around 310, we'll open the floor for questions from our audience, so to our audience. If you have questions, things you would like for this panel to address, please email those to Kate Beinkampen, that's K-A-T-E dot B-E-I-N-K-A-M-P-E-N -E -E at A-E-I dot org, or tweet them to hashtag Ask AEI Tech. Again, that's hash A as, excuse me, hashtag A-S-K-A-E-I-T-E-C-H. So Janice, um, let, let's begin with you. The states are in the process of getting NTIA approval on their bead plans. And we're still in the early stages of effort, even though the legislation has been out there for over two years now. The preparation has taken some time. The review process that you and um, that you're leading emphasizes transparency, which is making sure the public and other interested people know everything that's going on emphasizes efficiency, which is getting taxpayers the most bang for their broadband buck, and accountability, ensuring that everyone keeps their promises. Those three areas are emphasized because those have been the problem areas in the past, the major sources of failure. So what convinces you that these three states seem to be amongst the best of all the states that are working as in, at least in those three fronts? Yeah, th thank you, Mark. So I will go in order of um, 
the the way that you introduced the representatives um, and and begin with uh, Mississippi. And Mississippi's transparency and accountability are absolutely excellent. Um, one of the main reasons for particular interest in Mississippi is that it has a relatively large percentage of the population unserved or underserved. And um, to me, this makes the use of the bead money even more important than it might be for other states that have fewer communities struggling to obtain high quality access. Mississippi is doing very well. Their website is excellent, so it's easy to navigate and exceptionally clear. And it's written in a way that citizens can understand the process and how it can be impact, expected to impact them. Um, it's, it's just very well done. Um, I'm gonna switch to Louisiana. Uh, Often among those of us doing research in the field of broadband and broadband policy, people cite Louisiana as among the top performing states in terms of their state's policies and prior performance. And it's important to support or refute that sort of standard belief. And in this case, our research supports it fully. As far as we can determine, Louisiana is following theoretical best practices for pursuing uh, the most appropriate broadband policies for their citizens. Their volumes one and two include all the information that we would expect to see from a state that, uh, that has the process well underway and that is striving to be as clear as possible for citizens and subgrantees alike. In that way, the subgrantees are are aware that they will be held accountable and, and the citizens can also look to the public forum to watch that process as it unfolds. And then Idaho um, isn't usually among the states that's first to jump to researchers' minds when they think about optimal broadband policy, uh, but it should be. Um, Idaho's broadband office website is impressive. It's, it's clear, it's complete, it's easy to navigate even things as basic as fonts and layouts that make it readily navigable for citizens. And that's a huge part of transparency. They have infographics, they have links to their annual reports and resources, and their volume one and two drafts and five-year action plan are easy to find. They even offer drafts in Spanish. So their transparency is excellent. And that's going to play into the accountability because the more people that can see and understand what the state is doing, the more accountable the states will be held and the more accountable the subgrantees um, will be. And, and the volume, their volumes one and two content, like Louisiana's, clear, complete, follows best practices. Thank you. As we talk through uh, those issues with these, these state leaders, be coming back to you and ask you, you know, if you would want to add anything to what they've said on what stood out to them, because anybody will say, well, we, we have a website, we have reports, what's the problem here? So we'll probably need to dig into, you know, what makes someone stand out in that regard? All right, so um, Sally, let me, let me turn to you. And I wanna talk about transparency with you, because transparency is hard especially with something as complex as the bead program. It's, it, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of jargon. It's, it's hard for the average citizen to know what in the world is, is being done. And there's a lot of money involved. And anyone that's been involved in a program that has a lot of money, you know, people like to close doors and have private discussions. Um, and um, as our common friend that I mentioned earlier, Marty Linsky famously has said, that uh, transparency is overrated. You know, Marty emphasizes that when you have to have really tough discussions that involve some trade-offs, boy, doing that in public, um, sometimes it's, it's impossible to do. But Mississippi seems to be finding ways to publicly engage with broadband providers, the public, journalists, et cetera. What are you doing that uh, perhaps other states should try? Our focus is to be just as clear as possible with our policies, with our map, with our information on our website. Uh, those of us who work in these broadband offices, we're in this every day. We know the terminology. We work on it every day. 
other people do not. And you've got to remember that. And so we strive to put in everything in very simple layman's terms whenever possible. I, I do not have a background in technology. I'm an attorney. I've been in the Senate. Uh, so I, I'm sometimes the litmus test. Sometimes I get something that's written and I say, you know, I, I don't even really understand what that is. So let's go back and say it perhaps in a more clear manner. So very important to start off with very clear wording. Uh, and then we've, we've learned some lessons too. Uh, we have, you know, done some things that, you know, we thought it was great. We thought it was great to update our map, have some additional things. And, and I had some groups come to me and, and they took it a different way. They, they were like, Oh, you, you updated the map. You made all these changes and we have no idea what, why. And it became very apparent to me that it is important to, uh, as my, math teacher always told me to show my work. If we do make changes on the map to move something from unserved to perhaps federal funding, federally funded or, or move it into a served category because there's been a build out um, that, that we know about in our office because our particular access to information. But it's important to make sure that that information is provided to all of our stakeholders. So, you know, as, as I had one group tell me, they said, you know, help us to trust you. And, and that is what providing additional information does. Let me ask you to elaborate on something. Um, of all of us here, you're the only one with a political background and communicating in a political environment is really different than Janice and I. We work in academic environments, um, beneath and Ramon work work in the kind of the the departments and the bureaucracy somewhat. Do you find it to be an advantage that you've had to communicate with the public a lot to get them to get their votes? Um, do, does it become a disadvantage? What what are your thoughts? I think it's been a great advantage because through my experience, I, I was in the state senate for nine years. And, and through that experience, I got to be familiar with so many statewide groups. Um, you know, the associations for the Board of Supervisors, the Mississippi Municipal League, our uh, economic development groups. I've known them in other capacities. And so I'm able usually to call up the head of it. They take my call and, and, and schedule the meeting. So it's been very helpful, I think for us to access different groups with my background. Um, I have often said that my uh, contact list in my phone is much more important than I am. Uh, you know, I do have a lot of, a lot of contacts that I've been able to call on. And, and also I think, um, you know, I pay a little extra special attention to my legislators. Uh, we've had, we've hosted a couple of days at the Capitol with my office. I, I bring my staff over. Uh, we have the map up on our computers and try to give them additional information about their own districts because legislators are, are getting a lot of questions about broadband service and, and all of this money's coming down and why hasn't it gotten down my road yet? Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to provide uh, our legislators with all of that information that they need to answer those questions by constituents. Well, that that's really interesting. Um, you know, for those of us who are kind of technical experts, we sometimes view the political world as as a very foreign world. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, it's it's just, well, maybe those people don't really serve a useful function. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can happen in, in our space. But understanding and listening to the things that you learn and the relationships you have because... Of, of the political space you be, have been in. That, that's an important thing. If, if we have time, I'd like to come back sure. to that topic and ask you, And the, but this will be down the road. Um, if a broadband office doesn't have someone like you in it, what are the right ways they could reach out and talk with legislators to get that kind of uh, expertise um, in their communications work? But we'll we'll come back to that. So um, at any time, if any of the other panelists want to chime in on a topic, just uh, let me know. Um, I'm going to move on. Otherwise, oh, Vineet, go ahead. I wanted to uh, piggyback off what, what Sally said. Uh, the, the number one thing is know thy audience, okay? People in rural 
states, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, you know, Idaho, for decades, they've been clamoring for a infrastructure piece that's going to better impact their lives, both personally and professionally. So it's been a personal issue to people when there's an unequivocation between investments that go to urban areas versus those that go to rural areas. And for the first time, you now have a program where it's largely flipped, where people in rural parts of states are going to have, um, in, in sort of the pecking order, better internet than people that live in urban areas, which may be largely underserved. And because this is sort of a once in a lifetime kind of investment, there is greater accountability that the constituents have on their legislators who then have it on us to ensure that not only A, they get prioritized, but B, we make sure that the dollars go to absolutely areas where there is no federal obligation. And I think where, where it becomes a challenge and why um, you have to be really clear in the communications piece, as, as Sally has said, is because of what you said earlier, Mark, which is there are 150 different broadband funding programs. In Louisiana alone, there's a half a dozen, four of which we don't manage. Mm -hmm. right? right? And so part of it is the, the frustration um, that exists um, is, hey, I'm getting funded by something else that your office doesn't manage. How do we work together to help solve some of those needs? And that's why over communicating with all sorts of constituents are critically important. So I'm going to ask you, um, Vineet, to expand a little bit on how what you said about the, the rural people are kind of out being served first and how that relates to something Sally said about building trust with people, because these are people that are used to being at the back. And and how do you do that? But I, I want to um, to first go to um, something else that um, that you were saying. Um, it escapes my mind at the moment, so let me go to that that other question. Um, the rural areas have uh, been second, third, fourth in line in the past. Um, now they're first in line. How do you build trust with them so that they say, "Okay, yeah, the, this beneath guy, he's he's not just pulling my leg." Yeah, it's it's you know in, you know fortunately in Louisiana we are topographically and geographically we're a small state you can get from one end of the state to the other in about four hours and so we we've used that to our advantage and I've personally visited nearly a hundred cities towns and villages throughout the state of Louisiana making multiple trips to those same constituents oftentimes on a quarterly basis to do a couple of things hear them out right I mean largely people vent because out of sheer frustration as opposed they're not venting at you as opposed to wanting um, to vent in order to speed things up. And so what I often do is, is then give them homework assignments on a quarterly basis saying, if you want us to speed things up, I need your help in doing something, right? Whether it's permitting, whether it's it's making sure there's alignment with the subcontractors, if there's alignment with the ISPs, making sure that people are aware. Um, and so, I, so part of it is constant communication, uh, uh, Mark, and, and part of it is um, constant communication where you actually show up. Sometimes I'll travel four hours to go to a uh, a parish um, administrator meeting for 20 minutes to give them an update, and they truly appreciate um, someone from Baton Rouge, from the Capitol, coming to see them. And so that's where the problems are. We are and we're very clear also, the last thing is, one of the things that are really, what's really important to our office is to translate um, challenges that people have into policy recommendations and into actual legislation. And so people have seen, especially those that represent rural parts of Louisiana, people have seen ideas that they've pitched to us based on challenges actually result in um, actual legislation and actual state law. And so I think they appreciate the fact that we're listening to them pretty actively. All right. Very good. I, I appreciate that. And I do recall, but it was just a comment I wanted to make when you talked about you had six broadband programs you said in louisiana yeah I, I quoted that number 150 um no one should be under the illusion that there's any coordination amongst those those programs at all uh that is is something that is complained about in in the u.s senate and u.s house um although they're the ones who could do something about it they they primarily complain about it um but um it's it's tough 
with uh, with everything that's that's all these different moving parts. So let me pull you into the conversation, if I could, Ramon. And, and I want to shift our topic a little bit to this issue of efficiency, getting the taxpayers as much as we can for their money. Um, our AEI standards in this area are pretty high. Uh, maybe it's because we're just a bunch of economists, but uh, this has been an area of problem in all the other programs that have ever had much research done on them. And our assessments on this particular topic have caused some heartburn for some of your peers in, in other states, but not for Idaho. And I was wondering if you could tell us what you're doing to squeeze as much effort as you can out of broadband providers, at least in your plans and maybe in the programs you've had so far, and to let markets adapt as technologies, consumers, and the economy changes. Yes, well, thank you very much for that question, Mark, and to the AI team for the opportunity to speak uh, today with everyone and uh, great colleagues to have on this panel as well. So yeah, when it comes to efficiency, Idaho has tackled it from numerous different positions, and I appreciate the comments that have already been made as it relates to the politics that are involved in this. And so a lot of our efficiencies have started based on the policies that are championed by our governor, Governor Little. Uh, when he first took office, one of his first uh, goals and objectives was to clean up the red tape. And so we're talking about going through administrative rules throughout the state departments, as well as Idaho code, to clean up any opportunities where it was either antiquated, outdated, uh, maybe it was superfluous in terms of being duplicative. And so after a several year effort of cleaning up, again, administrative code and Idaho code, we've successfully become one of the least regulated states in the entire union. And so that has directly impacted our ability here in the Idaho Office of Broadband to find some of those efficiencies. Um, we know many of the states across the country, including the ones represented today, are pro-business, and Idaho is no different. But we really do take that extra step to not only be a pro-business state, but treat the small businesses equally as the large scale businesses. And so because of this work over the last couple of years, we're directly seeing that impact our, our programs in a positive way. I think another thing that we, we learn from those types of activities and experiences is how do we translate that into our, our own work? And so for the BEAD program specifically, you know, when, when the Idaho Office of Broadband works with our board, our legislature and our stakeholders, we really want to put the lightest touch of government possible on any of our policies or requirements. And so although there are some instances where states can be more restrictive, um, create a few more cumbersome regulations within their programs, that's the opposite direction that the state of Idaho moves. And so I think that's had direct positive impact. And then specifically to the piece about, you know, how do you how do you get the ISPs to participate in kind of that same vein with that mentality and where we've seen a lot of success is public-private partnerships. Um, and you had mentioned, you know, I've got a vast experience in transportation world. And in Idaho, we were really able to leverage those PPPs to build large-scale construction projects that we likely wouldn't be able to achieve in Idaho when it comes to the highway system. And we're seeing the exact same thing now with our broadband infrastructure projects. Through our capital projects fund, we set a really high level standard when it comes to those public private partnerships. Um, over half of the money that we doled out, which was a total of 120 million, went to PPPs. And so that's another way of not only leveraging the existing resources so you get that on the ground efficiency, but also the efficiency of spreading out those dollars. Let me, I'm going to ask you two questions on, on what you just said. Um, one is the the use of the public private partnerships, and I I do this kind of regulatory teaching all over the world, and there's a lot of PPPs that are not in the U.S. But one of the challenges of those always is how do you make sure that the competition or the from the private sector to participate is intense, so you you extract um, as much value out of them as you can. So I want to talk about that. Then I also want to talk about if you're going to be very kind of pro letting businesses and consumers um, make decisions, how do you deal with the political risks of, of failures? Because failures will happen. So let's let's ask them, I'll just focus on the first one. How do you make sure that these internet service providers really are giving you the best deal that uh, they possibly can? 
Yeah, that, that's a great area that we definitely spend time thinking about in terms of that engagement and that participation. Of course, ISPs across the spectrum have different types of business models, and there are some that are a little bit more appropriate for or geared towards those collaborative type projects. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of communication, and I think it's really us trying to uh, share with our stakeholders and our providers that we've got certain objectives and priorities. And when it comes to the BEAD program, our, our real objective is that 100% connectivity across the board for all un and underserved. And so my experience has been that if you can get these ISPs to understand and kind of record, recognize the statewide goals and objectives, um, sometimes that can help break down some of the barriers on the ground. And then I also think there's there's some trust, right? Like we, we, we already talked a little bit about the lack of trust that can uh, exist with our rural partners and local jurisdictions, communities. I think there can also be some lack of trust between those local communities and the ISPs. And so where the I, Idaho Office of Broadband comes in is in many instances, acting as a facilitator or a mediator, um, you know, it, trying to explain to folks that just, just because something bad maybe happened 10 years ago with X provider, today could be a new day. So let's revisit these relationships and these experiences. Okay, and I'm gonna ask in a little bit, I'm gonna ask Vineet to talk about the accountability issue, but you just alluded to it, um, but in a reverse way. And so I'll ask you about it after he's spoken a little bit. I just want to warn you, you put up, you talked about the issue of trust in the sense that if you as a government official make a commitment to a private entity that here's what the rules are going to be and 10 years from now or even five years from now there's a lot of political pressure to change the rules how can they trust that when they've made the financial commitment the government is going to keep its commitments as well we'll, we'll get to that but let me just ask you about the other thing i was going to i wanted to raise it's often true that government officials are very risk averse because, Ramon, if you do a tremendous job, the newspapers in Idaho aren't going to write stories about you. You make a mistake, they will write stories about you. How do you deal with those kinds of risks, help the political, the, the politicians deal with the risk of that as well? How do you manage that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's probably what a lot of us share in common, both my colleagues here on the panel and, and those listening and tuning in today, is there's a lot of different bosses. You know, you've got the executive branch at play, the legislative branch at pay, play, ISPs, and then local communi uh, communities. And so I think Beneath did a good job of kind of highlighting the importance of communication and collaboration. It really does mean a lot when a director of a broadband office shows up at a rural town meeting. Um, because I am confident to say that there's only some of these states that, that are performing at that level. And so I think that immediately builds some good graces I also think in terms of that trust, you know, what what challenge we sometimes have in Idaho based on our geography, you know, to get from South Idaho to North Idaho is about 12 hour drive. All of our population is in the southern area of the state and specifically in the Boise region where I'm located. So one of the one of our first efforts administratively was we created a satellite office in North Idaho, specifically Lewiston. And so that was a really big effort on our part to show stakeholders across the state, regardless of where you are, hey, we're serious about this. You don't have to come to Boise. We're going to come to you. We're actually going to plant someone in your area, in your geographic region, so you have someone to go to on a regular basis. And you wouldn't believe how much goodwill that act really did uh, capture for us. It, it was really a monumental effort, but the, the success was definitely felt as well. Okay, so that gets back to something that Sally was talking about and and having this kind of over communication, if you will, because um, once 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 people cannot see what you're doing, they assume that something bad is going on. And, and so that over communicating gets really important. And and Janice, I, I failed to follow through on my commitment earlier, so uh, Ramon can get on to me for that. Uh, and I'd said after we talked about each topic, I'd wonder, I'd ask you, tell me more about how someone stood out. So let's go back to Mississippi on the transparency. What did you see that was different for, for Mississippi? Because uh, everybody's got a website, everybody talks. What's different there? So we're looking for things that are, are very specific when we're thinking about how to evaluate a state's policies. And so... Um, I'm, I'm looking for um, 
are the, uh, are the households that are unserved and underserved easily identifiable? Do you tell us what they are in a small geographic unit or, or, or can people really not tell? Um, those kinds of things that are, that are easier for citizens. But then for the, this process of what to do with the bead money, we're, we're very specific with that also. And so one of the things that Mississippi has done is they have a scoring rubric for what, for reviewing their sub grantees proposals. And they have specific objective criteria for evaluating those proposals. They include point systems for, for um, the speed of deployment. They, they include um, competitive process. They don't require, uh, reg they don't require regulations that are above and beyond what we would need to hold subgrantees accountable. They allow for market-based pricing. Mm -hmm. They, um, those, those kinds of things, they help with access to rights of way and conduits and poles, and they have policies in place for those sorts of things. So we are looking at very, very specific objectives that we can say, yes, a state is actually, has committed on paper to do this and to require subgrantees to follow through as well. And then similarly, Ramon's talking about, yeah, how they hold people's feet to the fire so they're really efficient. What did you see differently in, in Idaho, for example, versus states that um, maybe weren't quite so uh, quite so assertive? So, so we see um, in their in their paperwork, they they have indicated that they're going to use an effective and transparent competitive process. So they're going to do um, an appropriate auction for for the area that they're um, that they're hoping to serve. Those kinds of things that that um, we've found to be economic best practices, but they, they specify that. They say, we are going to pursue a competitive market and this is exactly how we're going to do it. Um, and that's just unusual. So, so many of the states say, yes, we're, we have a rubric and we will allow, uh, we will take into consideration this or that. But these states have numbers. It's specific and it's objective. And it's not it's not random, and it's based on competitive market, and that's really the best we can ask for. Beneath, you've spent some time talking with some of our scholars about that very issue, yeah. and Louisiana, as I recall from the discussions, has a fairly unique way of of running something that's really close to an auction, but not quite. What what is to describe that process to us? Because some maybe some other states would find that useful and interesting. Yeah, and, and part of it, uh, Mark and Janice um, had, the way we designed our program is based on uh, histrionics of other grant programs that we've executed and based on what we've seen throughout the country. What we didn't want is past as prologue again as we execute the largest amount of money that uh, every state's going to receive. And so a couple of key things that we did are which are fundamentally different than the ARPA round that we ran a couple of years ago. The first is we're going to have a pretty exhaustive and extensive pre-qualifications round. Okay, so what we want to do is make sure the right companies that have the execution skills, that have ex successfully executed federal grant programs, um, that have great relationships with the community, can um, execute in the way they that we feel they can based on post pre qualifications process. So that's you have to be invited to enter post the pre qualifications process. The second is we had approximately 205,000 BSLs that were BEAD eligible, broadband serviceable locations that were eligible for our infrastructure bill uh, money. And we went through, we've gone through a challenge process. Our results are being cured right now with NTIA. That number is probably going to drop by 20, 20, 15, 20% to about 160,000 or so locations. And the number one fear that people have in rural parts of the state is those donut holes, right? So you, you start to see the, the donut holes that get created as a result of numerous other federal programs, in addition to those locations where because of these federal programs, you're now beginning to see an increase in velocity of private sector investment because you're creating that frenzy and fear among companies to now step up their game and to make those capital investments using their own dollars to, to compete, to upgrade infrastructure and whatnot. And so you know what we're doing to avoid those challenges around donut holes is we're going to probably create multiple hundreds and hundreds of different project areas. Uh, no more that, I mean, it's going to be significantly smaller than a, the parish boundaries, but we're creating the project areas with the two key 
uh, thematic areas in mind. The first is we need to make sure that the business case for the ISP is as competitive and strong in designing those project areas because you want you don't want to create a project area where you don't get any bidders. So what we want to do is create project areas where the blend of unserved and underserved locations and community anchor institutions create a positive NPV and a positive business case. Number two is you want to make sure you create a project area that satisfies a federal requirement, but also um, shows to the people that we're going to hit every single one of those locations as opposed to creating more donut holes. And so those are the, so that's how we're structuring our, our process is take the post challenge and results of BSLs, create project areas, and then run a two round sort of modified auction prices where we will attach a reference price to every one of the project areas, companies will uh, bid. And then for those where there are overlaps, then we'll tell them to sharpen their pencil a little bit and then and then uh, and reapply for those same project areas. Um, because we're fortunate to have an outsized allocation, um, you know, much like uh, Mississippi, you know, we could be a little bit more flexible in terms of if a company says um, in a project area where there's no fiber bidder and it's the only one and they say, look, I need a little bit more than what you've indicated in your reference price, then we would be open to um, increasing that reference price to ensure that those folks have access to to fiber. So that's how we're, we're running our process. That's how we'll do it. The other two really quick things that I'll mention, which again, going back to speaking to the needs of people, we will incentivize projects where 90% of the fiber plant is actually buried. Why is that important? Because much like Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, we get, you know, we're two months away from hurricane season. Hurricane season is now stretching to November. These storms aren't getting any weaker. And so that's really important. Um, and then the second is, and we got federally approved by NTIA back in December to actually also fund mobility infrastructure. And that's really important to us because we're going to designate some of these project areas as critical resilience nodes. And what that means is that that's an area where there's, there's frankly, a lack of mobility infrastructure. And so we will fund, and we did get approval from NTIA to be able to use some of our bead dollars to both fund the fiber deployment in a certain part of the parish, but also to help invest in mobile infrastructure to address issues around first responders and emergencies. So again, listening to people, understanding the behavior of, of our topography, of just what we face every day in, in Louisiana and making sure we, we create the most competitive program for ISPs, for people, but also from a policy perspective. Okay, thank you. That For our audience that may not be involved in, in some of the things that he was talking about, let me comment on, on two things. Uh, one was that that mobility issue. I'm in Florida, lots of hurricanes here, Mississippi, Louisiana gets them as well. And it's our, our electric utilities are very used to being staged, ready. So when the hurricane passes, they're in there right behind it. Uh, winds are still blowing, still raining, but they're in there rebuilding. Uh, the telecommunications is, is more difficult um, because of, of just the way the, the architectures and the technologies work. So you have to be able to roll in the mobile resources really fast. And so that's, that's a, a good way of understanding and thinking about that. The other thing we've mentioned several times this this competitive process for the internet service providers to get the money and we've mentioned auctions it turns out from the research that's been done that if you run a good clean auction process where price is primary and the companies are competing you can save well let me say it this way you can get twice as much uh, broadband for your buck with uh, with that type of a process so i'm really encouraged to uh, to see people um, trying to use those processes as much as they can. So, Vineeth, um, this is unfair, but I'm going to ask you another question again. So, we're just going to pile on to you. I'm going to change topics again. I want to get to this accountability issue. Um, our failings in the past, as I've mentioned before, have, have been threefold. Um, one, policymakers sometimes failed to hold the agencies that were managing the money accountable. Uh, for truly expanding broadband. So money would get spent, but not much broadband built. Uh, spending was uh, generally good enough. Sometimes the policymakers politicized the system. And uh, so I came across one situation where a broadband office had said, okay, we've held our competitive process. We're gonna fund these five companies. 
And the governor's office said, well, you Joe Fiber Optics over there, you didn't include that. And uh, they're fine fellows. You should give them some money, too. Now, that uh, that doesn't go well for taxpayers when that's a situation. And uh, thirdly, funding recipients are, have in the past often been paid um, even if they didn't make much of an impact. They've gotten their money and uh, done whatever they would do it. So what is Louisiana doing? to make sure these program these problems are not going to be occurring now in bead. Yeah, it's a great question mark on accountability because this is probably the crux of the entire issue because if if people I mean, there's general apathy in terms of government's ability to execute anyway and so if we screw this up then it's going to be a bigger problem uh in terms of building trust with the same constituency that you need to impact daily. So a couple of key things that we've done. So we have in state law so let me even take a step back. When we obligated funds for our, from our ARPA program, an obligation of fund doesn't mean that they get money from day one, the ISPs. And so the obligation means that the, these companies have a grant agreement that they've signed with us. And within the two-year period, six-month period, whatever that is, they have to execute and build to every single one of those households and small businesses that they said that they were going to do in their grant application. And so it's only when a company says, hey, I've built to 10 of these 100, 100 houses that they will then flag us and say, I've built to 10. I would like 10% of what I've asked for. We will then send technical people to actually verify that the work is done. We'll send compliance people to verify the work is done. And then we'll go through a process internally to review both reports and make a recommendation to the Office of Financial Support Services whether they should get paid. And so in certain cases, Companies that applied for certain areas, we didn't reimburse them for 100%, and we may have reimbursed them for 87% because they built to areas or they built to locations where there is no physical structure anymore. But that was based on the Form 477 maps right? that was used prior. So we have it in state law, A, that we'll only pay upon a, a uh, reimbursement basis based on thresholds, based on um, work that's technically audited. The second is... We have in state law that if a project fails to perform, then we have the right to claw back the asset, claw back the money. Now, with regards to bead, uh, because the stakes are significantly higher, one of the things that, uh, so we're going to carry forward some of the state law that we've talked about from ARPA, but to your point on execution risk of federal programs that our office does not administer, what we've put in the in our volume two of our, of our proposal, which was which was approved by the feds, by NTIA is the fact that if you are, for example, a company that's received um, a federal fund to build, let's say RDOF or a uh, USDA grant, and you apply for our bead funds and you receive our bead funds, and then let's say in Q1 of 2025, you default on those RDOF locations, then there is a penalty that you have to pay to the state of Louisiana, which is commensurate to the cost of building fiber to those locations that you defaulted on. And so... Uh, the numbers, those dollar amounts could stack up. And so a couple of weeks ago, we had a a, a house commerce oversight meeting. And, um, um, you know, Chairman uh, uh, Daryl Desitel um, had all of the uh, Ardoff companies come and attend and give an update. And so, you know, one of the Ardoff companies at, at, at during that meeting flagged for us and said, hey, we're going to go ahead and tell the FCC that we're going to default on these 2000 locations, which is fine. Uh, it's not fine, but at least it's not too late to incorporate those 2000 as in part of our bead uh, program as a, as a backfill. And so, you know, we're doing things to to put positive pressure on companies to execute and put positive pressure because the last thing we want to do is on December 31st, 2026 and December 31st, 2028, respectively, ARPA and bead, we have to return money back to the feds. And that it would be something that would be catastrophic to to, to the governor. So that's the last thing we want to do. So we'll put a continued pressure on these companies to execute as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. So for our audience, um, Vineet talked about something called RDOF. It's one of those 150 programs that are out there that has no specific relationship to beat in what these, these states are doing. Um, it is a, a program by the Federal Communications Commission prior to Congress adopting the the infrastructure bill that had companies bid to expand broadband in rural areas uh, because money was limited 
the expectations in terms of quality were lower than we, we have with bead and the timelines were longer. So it's really hard to coordinate what's going on in these states and what was going on with the FCC. So in some instances, some of the broadband providers are just going to the FCC and saying, what we were doing with our state is much higher quality. We're just going to give you your money back. And uh, so we do, we do see some of that going on. Um, Sally, let me, let me come back to you. So in, in the discussions we've been having, there's the, there's um, a lot of coordination that has to happen. A lot of relationships are going to matter. And that is something that you had talked about earlier. Um, and we talked, I'd also warned you that I would ask you about how these, these broadband offices should work with their legislators, et cetera, to make sure that everything is going well. So what, what is your advice to people in terms of, of how to build the right relationships in the political environment, business environment, but then also what kind of working relationship do you want to have with your state legislators, governor's offices that allow the good quality work, but um, keeps all of them well in the loop and takes advantages of their skills? First, I want to loop back just a, a moment to what you were talking with Vanith about um, as far as accountability. And I think the importance of state broadband offices in this BEAD program is, is different than other programs, of course, that have come down from the Fed. So, uh, for example, Mississippi has a very large uh, ARDOF award made to various providers, and that is uh, really managed by the FCC, very maybe has some some pretty uh, loose timelines or some some far out timelines. So long, it's yeah. Yeah, long timelines. That's the right word I'm looking for. So uh, I think having a state broadband office, I believe uh, Mississippi and Alaska, we were the last two to come online on our state broadband offices. We've been here for only about 18 months, but it's so important in that accountability piece we, we know the providers in our state, we're familiar with the different issues in our state, and, and we can kind of separate fact from fiction. Uh, for uh, legislators and for elected officials and constituents who say, oh, well, I heard this or this group got money for this, and we're able to know what the truth is, because it is so complicated with so many different programs, um, mapping information that changes all of the time. So being that source of truth for uh, our states, I think has been very important and will lead to more accountability. But a as far as the relationships that you want to have, um, you know, I would, you know, you want to remember that our, our legislators and all elected officials are, are busy, busy, busy people. They have a lot on their plate. So you want to make it your conversations with them, again, as, as simple as possible um, and, and put it into perspective for them. You know, if I'm talking to a legislator, I, I'm going to have his or her uh, county stats in front of me. I'm going to know how many unserved or underserved uh, homes are in that county. So uh, I have my big book of broadband I carry around with me in addition to my my map that's easy, easily accessible. But, you know, they're looking for information and you've got to be able to provide it to them in a, a digestible manner. I think that's the key. And I, I have found that to be very true, what you, you just said. I had a very eye-opening experience quite a few years ago now. I was helping a lot of professors around my university work on energy issues and they related to public policy. So we actually had a meeting in Washington, D.C. with some federal senators. And we asked, we're asking them, how can our science and our research help you do your policy, create the right policies? And they said, forget it. You can't um, because I get five, I get 15 seconds or maybe even a minute mm -hmm. with a constituent. I can't show them all the stuff you do. And right. they've got a problem and I've got to focus on that problem. That's a different world. And it's hard for academics to plug in and be helpful in that, but that's the world that all of you have to succeed in. It is. They, they have so many things on their plate uh, and they're moving from one topic to another. And so it is our job um, to make our conversations or, or interactions with them 
um, easy for them to understand and then use in a way that they can with their constituents to whom they're ultimately accountable for, to. So on, on this topic of accountability, Ramon, let me come back to you on the question I warned you I was going to ask, that how is it that you can be held accountable or, or your, your legislators, whatever it will be, because once a, a private business has committed, it's going to make these kinds of investments, it's going to meet these milestones, and here's how much money it will receive to do that. How do we ensure that Ramon's going to keep his word on the commitments he's made or that the state of Idaho will keep its word? Absolutely. I think that's a, a great question, Mark. And, and I'm going to weave it a little bit with the comments made by Mississippi and Louisiana. And, and for our listeners, I think what's great about this conversation on accountability is there's different ways we can we can approach this. Louisiana talking about, you know, changing law, having certain language and agreements. Sally doing a good job of talking about how you build that trust and build those relationships. And that equals, you know, accountability on a large scale. And then for us in Idaho, we've really approached accountability from a structure and process perspective. So what makes Idaho unique is we have not only the Idaho Office of uh, Broadband, but we have the Idaho Broadband Advisory Board. And the Idaho Broadband Advisory Board is a nine member board, which has six sitting legislators, three reps and three senators, and then also three appointees from the governor's office. So compared to other boards across the country, very political in nature, um, but what that does is it creates that real checks and balances. You've got the office representing the executive branch. You have this board, which has full authority when it comes to spending decisions, award decisions, policy decisions. And so there really is kind of this beautiful give and take uh, between the two branches uh, of government working together. Now, of course, there can be times where sometimes that negatively impacts our efficiencies uh, because trying to thread that needle in terms of what, what does a board uh, need to decide versus the office, but it really creates this accountability because the ISPs and the stakeholders not only come to the Office of Broadband and the team for answers, but they also get to go to their board members. Um, and so having, having that as kind of a dichotomy, but also working in conjunction with each other has helped really enhance the, the levels of accountability, at least the visibility of it. So Janice, on accountability, what was different in these states or other states that were ranked very, very high in that regard versus those that did not? Uh, what, how do states fill that gap? I think the states that were not, that didn't have things written into their their documents um, fully are, are, are missing out on even being, um, being able to be held accountable. So by limiting the information that's available, by not publicizing out, remember, we're just academics. So in my, in my analysis, I'm sure there's a lot going on. I mean, I know how hard the states are working and the broadband offices and the, the subcontractors who are, who are scrambling. Um, we're well aware of that. What I am looking for is what a, what a regular constituent would be able to access. And I, I think that there, there are some states who, are, um, who have shored up their plans and they don't want to share them. And they have on purpose withheld significant information and have said to us, our, the scholars team, we're not gonna share that. And I think that's a disservice. I understand it, but I think it's a disturb disservice to themselves and to their constituents. Um, but it's it's really just a, a a lack of presence of the information. Um, for example, something as simple as uh, these states have some of them have put parts of their scoring rubrics in an appendix, right? And so it'll say A through E. Most so so the the states that we have rated very high on for accountability, those sorts of things, they said yes, we'll hold them accountable, but they won't tell us how. So we'll hold them accountable accountable, it's in Appendix D. And there is no Appendix D. It says it will be put here. <laughs> so, so we just don't know. you know. And that's more of it than anything else. Remember, we're still at the planning stage. So, so I know that 
that our state reps are in a different position than I'm in. I'm looking at a planning stage. What has happened to this point that we can that we can look to? Let's let's build off of what you just said, Janice. That this is a planning stage still. Um, I know beneath the NTIA has approved your plan, so you're moving into execution. Idaho, Mississippi, has NTIA signed off, or are you still in discussions with them? We are still in discussions in Mississippi and working on curing our plan. Uh, Vanith is our overachiever in the broadband world. Uh, Louisiana and Virginia, I believe, have, have gone first and, and gotten their plans in front of NTI uh, quickest. Um, we wanted to spend some time in Mississippi, and in fact, I've I've slowed down this challenge process that uh, we've referred to because we wanted to have a little bit of additional time in Mississippi to make sure our map is correct, to do some out further outreach in communities who are, are very concerned about getting left behind without service. So we want to make sure they fully understand this challenge process and can participate in it. So, um, We've slowed down just a little bit, which is going to, to slow us down on some other things, but only only by a month or two. But we are still in, in discussions and getting our final volume one and volume, volume two approved. Okay, so let me ask then, as you move, and Vanith, you can tell people how it's gone, I guess, or it's yeah. going. As you move from planning into execution, what are the hurdles that uh, the state's are finding it difficult to overcome, to go from, hey, we've had these talks, we've got these ideas, now it has to be done in detail. Well, I, I think the states are ready to move on from the planning and approval process, and they want to move towards execution because they hear, I mean, think about the downward pressure that's being placed on the state broadband office from your uh, congressional delegation, state legislators, ISPs, and, and people, right? And part of it is why aren't things moving fast enough? Why aren't things getting approved? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, fortunately we got approved for a volume two last December. And so we're right now going through a curing process of our challenges. And for us, as soon as we we get the, the go ahead and the green light from NTI on the results of our challenge process, we're gonna, you know, release out project areas that I mentioned earlier. We're gonna make that public, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks for public comment, 30 day public comment period. And then, uh, and then it's sort of down downhill from there, from our perspective, in a, in a good way. We because we were approved last December, we're on the clock, right? So we've got twelve months to obligate the entire one point three five five billion, which includes submitting our final proposal by mid December, and then working backwards, you have to go through a thirty day public comment period with our final proposal, and so which means we have to get all the work done effectively by November. So um, it's going to be an intense six seven months. Uh, but again, the faster we can move the execution risk from our office to the ISPs um, and to other organizations, then uh, then I think people will feel a little bit better that we're we're no longer considered to be perhaps in the way, as opposed to we're we're now out of the way and now the work is being done by ISPs. Ramon, as you look ahead, what what are you seeing as hard to uh, the your hardest challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Idaho sounds like we're probably in a similar position of, of Mississippi. Right now, a lot of our efforts are focused on ongoing communication and outreach. We're trying to create some energy and some buzz behind the state's challenge process. We're still several weeks away from, from that going live as we do the internal building of our portal and whatnot. But um, I think that just really trying to make sure that people are going to be at the table and, and willing and ready to participate. I think that's one thing that's top of mind for us as we go forward. Um, so like, you know, an, an example of how we're trying to incorporate that formally into some of our processes would be, you know, having a two week preview window. So we'll have a full two weeks where everything is published, open for pre-registration. We'll hold webinars. We'll have open office hours. And that way, the, the idea of the thinking there is when we press go um, for that opening of the challenge process, a lot of the bugs and questions have kind of already been worked out. And so that's, you know, based on feedback we've gotten from other states and our and our stakeholders in terms of how we're kind of modifying on the fly. Janice? So, so I just want to 
offer one quick thing uh, for Mississippi and Idaho. I think that there is a pressure um, that that maybe people in the broadband office feel like we're, we're not first, right? And, and that's what we hear often, right? We hear, well, who's first? Who's ready? Who made it through the challenge process? And they're the ones that get the, the mm -hmm. um, I don't know, the, the accolades. And I think that it's doing um, Mississippi and Idaho a disservice because, and, and similar states, because they're being extraordinarily careful they're serving their constituents the way they know they need to serve those constituents. And I think rushing to be first, if you are not ready to be first, is a, it is a recipe for disaster that we have seen before. It, it's not wise. And so instead of, instead of looking, I, I know it comes with some drawbacks having to wait and being further down in the queue. Um, I, I think that's, that's just one of those things that's that you all are handling very well, and um, and I, I I wish more states were more careful as, as you've been. So in terms of proceeding with with caution, um, one of the pushbacks I hear on that is that the it takes a lot of resources to build broadband, supplies, people. Uh, there's and there's limited numbers of each. So I, I'm hearing that in some instances where, where broadband providers are perceiving the state as, as moving pretty slowly, they tell the state, well, you know, we're going to focus someplace else because we, we can only build so much and we're going to be in the early states and probably not going to pay a lot of attention to you. Is that real? Um, if it is real, how do you deal with it? Yeah, Mark, you know, part of the rationale why we're moving so quickly, um, I mean, look, moving quickly is also a function on of the of the team, frankly. I mean, our team is small. And so we would often turn around uh, documents back to NTI during the curing process within 24 hours, whenever they gave us a comment. And so the other thing is we really didn't have a an advisory board that we had to roll up. This was basically the governor and the legislature um, saying, go and go as fast as you can. Um, but, you know, part of the rationale we're moving so fast is, again, the downward pressure also on the ISP in terms of contractors and also in terms of supply chain, right? So we are next to Texas. So once <laughs> Texas, uh, you know, gets their program going and they're moving and they've got almost two and a half times the size of our bead funds, then you'll start to see perhaps a sucking sound in terms of <laughs> contractors and, and supply chain. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're committing $30 million of our bead funding to the community college system in Louisiana so that they can help build up a workforce between now and the next two years to construct and maintain um, uh, these networks, right? So we're doing that at the same time while it's, while it's you know, doing that and investing in our, in our workforce while at the same time ensuring that um, ISPs have certainty in terms of their contractors, their workforce, but also their supply chain. Okay, Ramon, Sally, what do you hear on that topic, or if anything? Ramon may have some some different uh, comments, but that's really not a uh, uh, something that I've heard uh, in our state. Uh, we have a lot of local providers, a lot who are using uh, their local contractors, and so we we expect some good results from them, but. Uh, we are not dedicating money to workforce development at the front end because I am concerned, though, about costs and as we move out. So we're being a little extra uh, cautious here in Mississippi. And I also expect our um, our challenge process to add some locations to uh, kind of what we have on our radar right now. So we're, we're being a little bit cautious and, and dedicating all of our money to deployment at this point. And then happily, maybe I can go back and say, oh, <laughs> now we want to use it for something else. But right now, all deployment. Yeah. Um, and, and Mark, to, to round that out, I mean, it's definitely something we're hearing from providers. I think uh, generally speaking, it's probably from the larger scale providers that are serving more than just Idaho. Um, one thing we did specifically address in our scoring rubric uh, when it comes to applications is giving some weight to Idaho laborers, Idaho contractors, Idaho companies, uh, not to discourage out-of-state workers, but definitely giving a little bit of a preferential treatment in, in terms of the scoring. 
Um, and then a little bit different than Mississippi in Idaho, you know, the likelihood of us being able to have any type of monies left over from the 583 that we were allocated is highly unlikely. And so we do plan on spending some amount of effort and resources on this front end when it comes to workforce development. I think it'll really be us playing a role in terms of getting um, the right resources in front of the ISPs and making sure that um, the, the labor market out there is aware of the opportunities and, and really being kind of a shepherd for, for some of the existing programs that we already have. And I, I think Vineeth might appreciate it if you gave bonus points for employees and stuff from Texas, and then he won't have that that loud sucking sound going on. Yeah, well, you'll have, you know, you have people from Texas. Maybe there are a lot of Louisianians that live in Texas. So hopefully they can come back home and uh, get gainful employment based on policies of the governor and what we're trying to do here in broadband. Yeah. So I also want to underscore something that, that Sally was talking about, and that's all of you have to set priorities. And, and and it's it's part of your context, what's really important in your state, what's important to the different stakeholders you work with, but then also what kind of, of expertise do you actually have? And and so as, as Janice and I have talked with some of the states and they they would tell us, well, you know, we, we just can't do X right now. And we'd say you may be doing the very best that you can because you can't do everything well all at once. You have to decide how you build things. And that is complicated for states. And unfortunately, you know, for them, perhaps, uh, but I don't think it's quite wrong, you know, Janice and I have have a standards that are just kind of uniform across, and uh, sometimes they're hard to reach, but we're hoping that in a year or two, everybody's up there very high, because by then, maybe some of the bugs and kinks will have been worked out. So let me um, I warn the audience, uh, we'll move to questions from the audience fairly soon. I don't see any yet, but uh, audience, if... Um, if you have questions, please email them to Kate Beinkampen. Again, that's K-A-T-E dot B-E-I-N-K-A-M-P-E-N -E -E at A-E-I dot org, or tweet them to hashtag Ask A-E-I Tech. Again, that's hashtag A-S-K-A-E-I-T-E-C-H. Um, before I get to any of those, though, let me... Um, let me ask, um, ask this, this question. Um, as you've looked around at uh, what other states have done, and, and Janice, this, this goes to you as well, because you've looked at all the other states, what are some of the really interesting things or really valuable lessons or ideas that you've seen that, that just aren't represented in our discussion so far? Uh, let me just kind of, let me start with, um, with Sally. Then I'll go to Vineeth, Ramon, and then then Janice. So you're looking for your question is for ideas. Yeah, things that, that you've that seen from other states aren't represented here that you found very useful. Um, I I think it it has been useful. Uh, we broadband directors meet periodically, and and so it's been very uh, helpful to determine how to. Uh, weight different aspects of our scoring rubrics as we move forward with this. Uh, it's also been uh, helpful to talk through uh, these areas that already have existing federal funding, for example, these ARDOF awards uh, that perhaps are not being built out and, and what is our response going to be and, and what is the response, uh, you know, is is there some value in, in all of the broadband offices in the nation kind of responding together? So, um, there have been a lot of, of conversations. Uh, we, we meet at least twice a year. Often there are some other meetings we go to. So very helpful um, conversations to share information across broadband offices. Okay. And, um, and Mark, you know, following up on Sally, when, when broadband directors get together, it's sort of like, you know, when you get ready for the SAT or ACT, you take those Princeton review classes or Kaplan. It's those, ex those classes on tips on how to get uh, or do get a good score. It's a very similar dynamic, right? So the broadband directors get together and we talk about, look, what do we need to do to, to continue to move the, the, the ball forward in getting approval from NTIA on a variety of different things from volume one and two. So at this point of time, as, as you, you and, and Janice pointed out, everyone is, it, everyone is really hyper-focused on, 
on really executing right what's in front of them, which is challenge process or curing and so on and so forth. What's what's what we're focusing on um, is and Mississippi has a, a similar situation, but probably less so than in Idaho, is the fact that we we anticipate just like Mississippi to have uh, funds available to do non deployment activities. And so non deployment means how do you where are those convergence points between you know broadband and healthcare, broadband and ag, or broadband and small business, broadband and workforce development. Because we're going to have to run a grant program for those dollars that are part of the overall bead capture. And so, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at other states, looking at how health systems are are, are developing innovative ways to deploy telemedicine. What are other states doing in terms of precision ag and, and using broadband to reduce operating expenses? What are other states doing that converges broadband and workforce development, especially as more and more people use the internet for a variety of different things, right? How does it impact small businesses and their ability to be successful, right? And so we, the, the complexities like that that Sally and I are going to have uh, and probably Arkansas and really the, stat, the states that we feel are going to have potentially excess funds, extra funds, is the fact that we're going to have to not only do the deployment strategy and execution, but also the non-deployment strategy and execution. And for some states, the non-deployment dollars are going to far outweigh potentially the deployment dollars. Why? Because to your point, that's what the reverse auction does. It's It rings out the, the, the capital inefficiencies in a way where you've got extra funds to do extra things. And so that's what we're actively doing now is sort of scouring the, the country to see, you know, what's happening in Mississippi, what's happening in Arkansas, what's happening in, in states that are geographically close to us culturally, politically, and economically to see where we can use some of our non-deployment funds to affect change there. Ramon. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit on this. I think from our perspective, maybe a little bit more just philosophical in terms of how we approach our work. A metaphor we love to use around here is, you know, you can only eat this elephant one bite at a time. And so don't let yourself get overwhelmed with all of the different parts and pieces of bead. It's a process you've got to work through. And then for offices of broadband across the country, I think it's important to recognize a couple things. A, you know, stay true to your goals and objectives. We have a set of values here in Idaho that are based on transparency, communication, collaboration, teamwork, and partnership. And so as long as we're focused on all five of those, I think that puts us on a really solid path. And then the other one would be, you know, the, the Office of Broadband cannot do this in a silo. It's absolutely mm -hmm. dependent on stakeholders and other participants to ensure the success of this program. And so those are a couple of things that we keep top of mind as we move through these processes. Okay. Janice, reactions? Thoughts? I'll be quick. So, so one of the things that I've seen that I did not, um, I, I only saw it several times out of the 51 sets of plans. Um, states, it would be very useful if they gathered appropriate data with respect to outcomes and not whether the money was spent, but what good the money did. And we should see actual results in terms of the number of households passed. Like who is connected? And then ultimately, why do we all want broadband? Ultimately, the highest goals, better education outcomes, better labor market, um, those kinds of things. And, and that's really the goal and appropriate statistics and statistical me methods. Um, there should be something in each state's plan to, to grab that information, right? There's a difference between um, hooking up a household and having that household actually using it and, and having a, a better economic outcome from it. And that's really the goal. Um, and then if I can add one other um, point, I think it's easy. No, I shouldn't say that. Um, sometimes in scenarios in which people work very, very hard and very intensely, um, it's easy to dig in and say, this is how we're doing it because we've worked so hard on this and we know what we're doing. And so, um, it, and I understand that, especially given that states found out how much money they would get in June, and I believe it was June, and then in December, your plans are due. Th that's not much time. That's a lot of scrambling. And um, when when we operate like that, sometimes um, we, we don't want to listen to what other people 
have to say and what other states have to say. So some states are interested in learning. I know that the states talk and I know the broadband offices talk. Um, I just encourage them to, to be open to listening to other ways of doing things and to look at what we as, as this academic team through AEI, what we're trying to do, not as punitive in any way at all, as, as trying to help and um, trying to provide information and, and, and just circulate ideas on what different states are doing and what's working and what's not working as well. And, and that's the goal. So, so not to shut one another out and be, you know, be so proud of what you've done. Um, being proud of what you've done is awesome. Um, but listen to how, what other people are proud of too and that's see what we Jan can learn. That's why Janice, those, those conclaves of broadband directors, when we get together, that's really important. So we had yeah. a uh, we had a conclave of broadband directors last November in New Orleans. I think maybe twenty or so broadband directors were there, um, and so that was an and we were all midstream and getting our volume twos worked on. And so it was an opportunity to say, "Hey, what is NTI telling you? Yes, okay, yeah. what is NTI telling?" You? Yeah, <laughs> I know. And 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 then, but not just states that look like you. Maybe yeah. maybe you hear something crazy from a different state, and you think, you know what, that might work. And I, and I see, so this is preaching to the choir, right? You all are doing this. Um, we have heard from states that say, we don't want any part of what you think. We're, we're doing what we want to do. Thank you so much, but we're good. And, um, and so, you know, to each their own, but you know, we're, we're just, we're not trying to be punitive. We're trying to be useful. So. I, I think an, another uh, item that you all need to watch, and I'm sure you are, is this uh, state money, the federal grant for states to provide some digital equity, digital skills, accessibility. We are awaiting that announcement. I hear we may uh, find that out just in a few days, maybe first of next week. Um, the allocation for states um, and then the, the real parameters of that program. Uh, all of the states have had to submit plans and it was a little bit difficult to submit that plan without uh, having the rules of the program or know how much funding would be attached to it. But it was very helpful to reach out to different groups around the state who are involved in making sure that our citizens of the state of Mississippi have a device understand how to use that device, understand how to use it safely. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking forward to that announcement here in just a few days and uh, how we can use that money in the best way to really close the digital divide in Mississippi. So and Sally, we, we actually did have that as part of this initial process. But as you know, when things started to slow down with the with that part of it, um, we've separated them. So I, I pulled everything that the state's Put out on that, but um, we've we we're trying to keep those separate separate buckets just because mm -hmm. um, we're not sure what the status is right now. Yeah. There aren't and that many states. There are not that many states that have got their volume. Well, there aren't that many states that have got their digital Louisiana digital opportunity plans approved. So, um, and again, to to Sally's point, that's new new information. If if we're gonna find out in a couple of days, but in, in federal in federal speak, a couple of days could be a couple of weeks, as Mark would know. So it could be. Yeah. Very well, could be. Knock, knock on wood. So yeah, and and this this will be a a very difficult topic area to actually have good success with. Uh, a lot of people have tried a lot of things over the past two and a half decades in this space and very few successes. Um, the, the key, as far as we can tell from, and some of our scholar team you know, have actually been heavily involved, is be very, very flexible because all the people who are not with broadband right now have different reasons why they're not. It's not a price issue, except in very few cases. It's, it's not necessarily a, um, uh, comfort with technology issue, except in a few cases, it just seems that that you you have to be very your broadband providers primarily have to be very adaptable to the local situation, and that's the Janice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of the main lesson we get from all the research that's been done. Yes, it's all the research has shown, um, and no results, uh, no no price impact. It's it's definitely not that. It's do they do. It, 
the majority of people find usefulness in having broadband. So it's not that they can't use it or they're scared of it or anything else. It's, I don't think I need that. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me what to do. <laughs> so. or, or, or Janice, we, when we've had focus group conversations with farmers, so Southwest Louisiana, a lot of the farmers in sort of the Acadiana, Lafayette, Louisiana, Lake Charles area, they're, the farmers there not only farm on the same field rice, but also crawfish and crawfish prices have gone uh, ridiculously high. And um, and so the governor's done a great job in in trying to get uh, relief for for crawfish farmers. But when I was when we were talking to um, the crawfish uh, and sort of rice farmers, what they said was, look, I know I need Internet. Um, I, I I know I need Internet. I know it's important. Um but give it to me and I'll figure out what to do with it. Right. And I think it speaks to we're we're probably going to see really wicked in a good way use cases of how Internet is being deployed through the sheer inventiveness of people in Louisiana, Mississippi and other states based on the fact that now they have a tool that they've never had. And I think that for us gets us really excited, especially as it moves sort of Louisiana's economy forward in a number of different ways. Yeah, I think that's what Mark is alluding to, or what, yeah. what, what he was saying is, is we, we have to, that's that's your individual, very local issue. And um, and we need to pay attention to those kinds of things. We've we've had people in terms of train of of how do we connect you, ask us how much do we need to pay you to not go to training? Yeah. So you know, it takes somebody like you all are doing, going, visiting, knowing who your constituents are, knowing who needs service and what exactly you could give them that might improve right. their outcomes. Right. But you're all doing the right things. Right. So uh, we don't have any questions from the audience. So let me move into kind of wrapping things up. And I'll, I'll ask each of you kind of what, what's your last word uh, for all of your state peers um, whatever that is, what you hope to learn from them, what advice you have for them, whatever that might be. And um, um, Ramon, I'll start with you, then I'll go to Sally, then Vanith, and Janice, you'll get the last word. So Ramon, what, what's your what's your last word for your, your colleagues and peers? Sure thing. I think I, I would emphasize, you know, patience as we work through this. You mentioned a handful of times throughout today's conversation, the, the multitude of different pressures and where those pressures are coming from, whether it's federal or, or local governments, and of course, all the bosses we have. And so just make sure that you keep a level of reasonable head as you as you deal with those pressures. And then I think, you know, another thing that I, I feel like we did a good job of uh, focusing on today was the importance of communication and collaboration. So regardless of where you're at in the process and, and really whether it's bead program or any other broadband program, make sure you're you know accessible to your local units of government, uh, to the ISP providers, large and small. And, and what we've seen here in Idaho is when you treat everyone equally, um, that's one of the, the ways that you can start building that trust. And so those are a couple of things I would, I would leave people with. All right, thank you, Ramon, Sally. Um, I, I would say that uh, transparency is not always easy. Uh, it is not always comfortable, but it is very important in this big undertaking that we all have for our states. Um, and the I think you go back to the data, and that's that's what I do, and that what we've tried to do is you know well, look this is what the data shows. These are the speeds that are here. This area is unserved or underserved. Um, so use that data, make sure you have it and that it is accessible um, and then be as transparent as possible. All right. Thank you. Vinny. You know, Ramon, I think, Ramon, you have only one employee. You're the only broadband. As, as of November of 23, there's three of us now. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Ramon has three people in his office. We have three people in our, on our office. Sally has 300 people in her office. I have six. I only have six. <laughs> my, I guess my point is this. I think people's expectation is, wow, you guys are covering a lot of ground that state broadband offices mean, which be, also means your teams are extraordinarily big. Um, obviously not the case, right? And so what, what that means is because the intensity of the work and the fluidity of the work 
is is so great because we've got a finite period of time to execute. Um, in, in Louisiana's case, you know, we have an open door policy. So anyone around the country, around the world that has a great idea, um, a great thought, a great way in which we can spend our dollars, we're, we're more than happy because there's probably significant blind spots that we probably have that we're not even considering based on based on just the, the size of our team and the fact that we can only cover so much ground, right? And so for for your listeners and viewers, um, you know, Mark and Janice, I, we're always open to hearing thoughts, ideas, comments, concerns about how we're we're progressing our our our, our efforts. And it was really interesting about accountability. In fact, I had last Friday someone email us. He's actually an engineer. He's a telecoms engineer actually building one of the cable companies' networks in the central part of Louisiana. And he emailed me and said in the subject line, um, a question about misuse of government funds. And so I actually called him. He was surprised I called him. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. And he goes, well, you know, Vinith, I'm scared. I don't want to say too much because I'm concerned I'll lose my job. But, you know, th there are things that he's doing where he's building in areas where they're already getting federal funding and and he's concerned. So he's doing exactly the right thing, which is expressing concern. But at the end of 20 minutes, as I explained the whole process, he felt uh, less less anxious because when I explained the whole process to him, he said, OK, now I see why what I'm building for this company makes absolute sense. And what I'm doing is actually upgrading infrastructure that you or our funding. And so I think part of that is is we we take we take pride and in, in enjoyment in having these conversations with folks like him who are or stepping up in a small town and saying, hey, I want I want to be help you be your eyes and ears to making sure these funds are are being spent right. And that's exactly the relationship we want with people throughout the, the corners of, of Louisiana. All right. Thank you. Janice, you get the final word. Thank you. Um, I, I think that whatever states can do to make it as easy as possible for their constituents to understand what's happening is is most important. Um, so transparency, can't say it enough. Accountability and critical, critical market competition. We need to use the markets um, or we're not going to see the results and and then actually, it's kind of nice that I get almost the last word. I hope Mark will cl close us out. I just want to say thank you because it's not easy to be on the academic side and trying to um, tr trying to get into the world of of what you all are actually doing on the ground. And you've been very accommodating, and um, and I and I appreciate it. So thank you. All right. Well, let me extend my thanks as well, Sally, Ramon, Vinith, and to you, Janice. Um, you provided some really useful insights, some important insights for people who are trying to make this work, to try, try and make sure that we've had lots of failures in the past, but not this time. Um, the battle to handle taxpayers' money with wisdom just never seems to end. So I'd like to thank everyone, um, our AEI uh, people who've, who've worked with us on this event, uh, everyone who's been in our audience. Uh, please watch for future events from AEI and share your thoughts. Let us know what uh, we should be talking about and what we should be paying attention to. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, everyone.